Welcome to today's Talks at Pulitzer, featuring John Cohen, senior correspondent with Science Magazine. Our topic, vaccines and the novel coronavirus. While we're waiting for more folks to join us this afternoon, let us know on the chat where you're listening in from, what cities, what countries you're in at the moment, because we really want to know who we're, we're talking with today in today's audience. So please go ahead and begin to share there. I know we have folks from Washington, DC, Charlottesville, Virginia, New York, Houston, some more folks from New York and, and DC, Boston, Massachusetts, Madrid, Romania, Spokane, Washington, Brussels, Istanbul, Pakistan, so thank you again for, for joining us and keep sharing with us uh, where you're listening in from. My name is Ann Peters. I'm the University and Community Outreach Director at the Pulitzer Center. And it's a pleasure to have John Cohen with us for the second in our Science and Health series this month. If you missed last week's session with Dr. Seema Yasmin, you'll find the video and an update by my colleague Holly Pipenberg at PulitzerCenter.org. Holly is also a producer of this series. We have worked with John through the years and it's an honor to continue that partnership, especially with the Pulitzer Center support for the work by John and his colleagues at Science on their COVID-19 reporting now and in the coming months. You'll find the Pulitzer Center website, on the Pulitzer Center website, much of this reporting incorporated into the science of COVID-19, a project that explores the nature of the novel coronavirus, the course of the disease, potential treatments and vaccines, the patterns of the spread across the globe and impacts on society. John specializes in biomedicine and is widely known for his coverage of epidemics, vaccines and global health. He's the author of several books, including two on HIV AIDS. As John says, journalism is a group effort, and we are proud to have supported the PBS NewsHour series, The End of AIDS, that in 2017 won the Emmy for Outstanding Science, Medical, and Environmental Reporting. That series was a collaboration between John at Science and William Brannig and Jason Kane of NewsHour. John's work is a great example, too, of why the Pulitzer Center does and provide support to so many journalists, many with expertise in areas they are reporting on. The Pulitzer Center started out in 2006, supporting just nine projects. Last year, we approved more than 180 projects from professional journalists and from 43 reporting fellows at our campus consortium partner schools who completed projects in 29 countries. On the education front, we reach thousands of students and educators each year via class visits, teacher professional development workshops, online, session, online sessions, and university events with our journalist grantees and education staff. And then of course, there are public events like today's. I want to mention one particular reporting initiative, especially for journalists around the globe, and that is our coronavirus news collaboration challenge at a time of scarce media resources, the coronavirus story challenges newsrooms to find creative ways to bring accurate, compelling, and timely information to the public and policymakers. We're eager to hear from journalists with proposals and involve strategic and concerted efforts to pursue reporting together. So that's the collaboration challenge for journalists anywhere in the world. We are also sharing work from our campus partners, students, faculty, and alums, on their reporting and more personal stories via our Speaking Out on Coronavirus project. I should note that we continue to support journalism and educational programming in on non-COVID-19 issues, so please visit PulitzerCenter.org to learn more. Now a few housekeeping matters before we move on to today's conversation. John will speak for about 20 minutes. We'll then have time to answer your questions, or at least some of them, we hope, during our Q&A. You'll see a Q&A icon on your screen, and you can begin adding your questions there throughout John's remarks. So please go ahead and get that started. 
There was also that chat icon on your screen where you told us where you're from. And I see we also have folks from San Diego, Denmark, and Mexico who have now come back in on the conversation. That chat icon is also more if you have specific technology questions. For example, all attendees are muted today, but if you cannot hear either myself or John at any time, let us know via chat. But remember your specific questions should go in the Q&A for us. We want to let you know that today we are also recording the session to post it online for others who could not join us today or if you wanna come back and listen to it again. One final housekeeping matter, please remember to stay online once our session is done today to participate in a brief survey to help us better serve your interests. And now please welcome John Cohen. And thanks so much for the uh, lovely introduction. Um, the host has asked me to start my video. Okay, I didn't know my video would stop. There you go. Am I visible now? Yeah. Um, hello, hello everyone, uh, and hello to the world. It's terrific that there are so many people from so many places, and uh, and I will try to speak from an international perspective as well. I'm based in San Diego. I'm sheltered in place. We started that pretty early in California. I work at home, so it hasn't really. Uh, harmed me all that much, except for the fact that my family is all here, which is nice. I'm enjoying it. Um, I'm going to go to a PowerPoint now. So give me just a second to load it. Uh, I have to share my screen. And here we go. I'll blow this up. It's going to take a second to blow up. There we go, is that, is that blown up? So I just wanted to go over quickly um, what we're talking about. We're talking about something that surfaced in my mind on January 8th, because that's when the Wall Street Journal first reported that there was a novel coronavirus causing what several of us had noticed, uh, this unexplained outbreak of pneumonia. That, that had been reported for several days. Those of us who cover infectious diseases, we were all on high alert but there are a lot of outbreaks of unexplained pneumonia around the world. Most of them just fade out, nothing. And when this one was first reported uh, on January 8th as a novel coronavirus, everyone who follows this stuff woke up and said, whoa, because SARS was a novel coronavirus. MERS was a no novel coronavirus. And the first reports coming out of Wuhan from the health commission there said this started in an animal market and the cases were largely clustered around the market. They shut down the market on January 1st and day after day they reported no new cases. So it seemed pretty straightforward. Animal to human jump, it went away uh, when the animals were uh, cut off from the humans. But as we soon saw that wasn't the story and it, and it wasn't accurate at all and that human to human transmission was occurring and occurring rapidly. So you see from hardly any dots on the map on January 22nd to a big jump by January 28th, still primarily China. But then, you know, uh, that should say April 13th. I'm sorry, I don't even know what month we're in because I'm in Corona standard time and I'm completely confused. But there, there are 2 million cases uh, around the world now. Um, this was the first, on, on, on the 10th of January, researchers from uh, China posted a sequence of the virus. Um, they posted it on JISAID, which is an influenza site used by influenza researchers to share um, sequence information, genetic information. And it was odd that it was posted on JISAID. Like those of us who follow this are like, why JISAID? What's going on? Well, what was going on was there was kind of a rogue group in China working with an Australian researcher who decided to put the sequence out there because it had been around for a few days and hadn't been posted publicly. But the moment that sequence was posted on January 10th, vaccine researchers had the tool to start making vaccines, as did diagnostic makers. And that's when the vaccine search starts at this moment, because you can take the sequence of virus and genetically engineer the pr surface protein from the virus primarily, which is the basis of most vaccines. I just wanted to show you what was happening in terms of air travel 
um, in January. This is what it looked like. This is how the virus was spreading. It was exploding. And everyone who followed this closely knew this. Uh, this is just showing you the sequence diversity. And, and this should give people some comfort. And I'm going to explain this. I know it looks crazy complicated, but it's really not. If you look at the lower right at those red dots, those are the human cases of what we now call COVID-19, and the virus is called SARS-CoV-2. Horrible name, I can't stand it, but that's the name, SARS-CoV-2. You see those red dots all stack up really tight on top of each other. That means there's very little variation between them. That's a really good thing. This virus just doesn't mutate that quickly. That makes it far easier to make a vaccine. I also wanna point out the purple dot underneath those stacked five red dots. That's the bat virus that's closest to the human virus. There's a long purple line that goes back to the junction point here. Can you see my arrow, I hope? That, that, that means that there's a lot of evolutionary distance between these human viruses and that bat viruses. The estimate is it's at least 20 years, probably longer, when this split happened. So this bat virus did not directly lead to this explosion in humans. It's just the closest one. At the top of the screen, you have SARS. And SARS, in these red dots, is linked to a civet. And as you can see, the relationship between the civet and SARS, they're right on top of each other. It's really convincing that the civet cat spread it. This is the landscape of candidate vaccines for COVID-19 from April 11th. The WHO puts this together. You can see this on their website. As of April 11th, by their account, there were three vaccines in clinical trials and 67 others being evaluated. So that's a tremendous amount of activity happening in a really short time. I've, I've covered vaccines pretty much since I was a kid. I, I started to write about uh, AIDS vaccines in 1989. I wrote a book that I spent 12 years on that came out in 2001 about the search for an AIDS vaccine. Um, I've never seen a vaccine search with this much funding, this much interest, and moving at this pace. It's crazy fast. And the reason these three vaccines are already in early human trials is because they could start on January 10th to make these vaccines. And I want to briefly go through what the different types of vaccines are that are being made. One type of vaccine is taking, uh, mo most of them are based around the idea of the surface protein um, and this, I just wanted to show you what this was for a moment. The Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, or CEPI, funds pandemic outbreak vaccine research. It put money into this in early January. So this is, the, this is just an illustration of the virus. Again, don't get hung up on the details, but the big circle on the left with the uh, things sticking off of it, those are the spike proteins. The reason it's called a coronavirus is because it looks like a crown because these spikes all put together look like the spikes on a crown. The heart of most vaccines is this spike protein because that's what the immune system first sees. And in theory, antibodies can glom onto the spike protein and prevent the virus from getting inside cells. Most people who think about vaccines and immunity think about antibodies. Antibodies are just one arm of the immune system. There's a second arm. Antibodies primarily stop viruses and other things from getting inside of cells by latching onto their surface proteins and preventing them from docking onto cells and infecting them. But a lot of what the immune system does is it clears out cells that have already become infected, which that's, that can be done by antibodies, but that's not the typical thing antibodies do. That requires a whole other type of immunity called cellular immunity, because there are cells that are killer cells that can identify an infected cell and clear them. So a vaccine can trigger both arms of the immune system. Many vaccines, most of the vaccines being made for COVID-19 are genetically re-engineering this spike protein and presenting it in different ways. One way to present it is to mix it with what's called an adjuvant. A lot of vaccines we have on the market use adjuvants. 
it's kind of voodoo science. They're kind of oil. They're things that just make the immune system go whack. They go, whoa, what's that thing here? And they make a more intense response. And the whole field of adjuvants began with Robert Koch and the discovery of pathogens and viruses. And he knew that when he mixed butter in with things that he got a stronger immune response. And it really is that kind of crazy, but it's part of vaccine technology. Adjuvants are part of it. Another way to do it is you can take the gene for the surface protein, for the spike protein, and stitch it into another vector, something that's going to deliver it. And then the body, the human body, will make that protein. And you can use another virus that's a safe virus, like a cold virus. Adenoviruses are very common vectors. They're Trojan horses. You can use the measles vaccine is being used as a COVID vaccine vector to bring in the spike protein. You can use um, DNA by itself, a circular piece of DNA, or you can use uh, messenger RNA, but they're all basically doing the same thing. They're delivering the gene or genes from the virus into the body so that the, va the, the, the body makes a fake version of the protein or parts of the virus. So they're safe. They can't cause the disease, but uh, they do trigger an immune response. Well, we hope they're safe. And, and that's, that's a huge question overshadowing all vaccine research. Lots of vaccines do what researchers want them to do in terms of stimulating the immune system, but the immune response they trigger sometimes can backfire and cause problems. You can make antibodies, and this has happened with the dengue vaccine, for example, that enhance the likelihood of you becoming infected and suffering severe disease. So there's a balancing act with safety. So the first vaccine in the United States um, that uh, went into a human, went into this woman, and, and, and I interviewed her, Jen Holler, at, at the university, she, she's at, in Washington. It was a Kaiser affiliate in Washington State in Seattle. And it was a vaccine that contained messenger RNA made by a biotech company, Moderna, in collaboration with the National Institutes of Health. A, a vaccine in China on the same day um, began clinical trials there. And because China's ahead of Seattle, the first human vaccinated in a clinical trial was in China. We also learned that there's this enormous collaboration between Johnson and Johnson and the US government, each gonna put up to $500 million to uh, launch their vaccine project. That one is using an adenovirus, a harmless human cold virus to deliver the spike protein. And there's also been talk about speeding up the timeline. And you know, every vaccine I've ever covered, people ask, how long is it going to take? It, of course, people want to know how long is it going to take. In traditional vaccine development, it can take five years, 10 years. There is no AIDS vaccine today. And I started to write about that in 1989. It's not a given that there will be a vaccine against anything. I'm enthusiastic and confident that we can have a vaccine against COVID-19 quickly. SARS-CoV-2, the virus does not appear that complicated to me. It's not HIV, it's not malaria, tuberculosis, hepatitis C, diseases that we, we've really struggled to make good vaccines against. It's easier than that, it looks easier. Um, so why does it take a year to 18 months? Why are they estimating that? Well, one reason is because you stage the testing. So you start in 10, 15, 50 people, just looking for safety and immune responses. If it looks safe and immunogenic is the word, if it looks like it stimulates the immune system, you then expand that same idea into 100, 200, 500 people. And again, if it looks safe and it's stimulating the immune system and you can measure, hey, am I getting a strong antibody response? Am I getting a strong cellular immune response? And then you can measure those things. And if you couple that with animal studies where you vaccinate an animal and then the word is challenge them, you intentionally try to infect them with the virus, you can see whether it works in an animal. And there are different levels of animal research that go all the way from mice up to monkeys. And there are lots of species in between. And researchers are still figuring out what the best models are and what the best models might be to test vaccines. 
But you couple all of that information from humans and animals, and then you say, okay, now we're gonna do a real world test. That real world test typically involves 5,000 people, maybe more. And you have to wait to see if there's a difference between placebo shots and the vaccine in a real world setting to see if the vaccine works. That all takes time. One way to short, shortcut this is to do what are called human challenges, where you take a human, vaccinate the human, a, a volunteer, very important, and you then inject them with the virus itself. Now, how can you ethically do that? It's complicated. One way you could do it is by selecting young people, 18 to 30 years old, who we know do not often develop serious disease from COVID-19, and uh, you could do it in them. Well, that's still dicey because we know that people who are 18 to 30 can die from this virus. It's not 100% safe. Well, let's say there's a drug that shows that it works against SARS-CoV-2. Well, then you can do a challenge study and add in the drug uh, if people get infected. You can also use a mock version of the virus to challenge people and see how they handle that mock version. The mock version can in fact be a different COVID-19 vaccine. I didn't mention two ways to make vaccines that I should have mentioned. They're old fashioned and they are being done here. One is to take the whole virus and kill it, inactivate it. The other is to take the whole virus and weaken it. Just let it be a live replicating virus, but you modify it so that it can't cause disease. Either of those things could be used in challenge experiments. So, so that's another idea. One of the big questions is whether seasonality is going to kick in here. And I did a story that came out uh, last month that I've been working on since October, ironically enough, about seasonality of disease. It's a very confusing topic. Um, it's a phenomenon that's been noticed for thousands of years by doctors, but there, there are all these theories floating around and very few hard facts, except for the fact that it is real. We know that influenza is a winter disease in uh, northern and southern hemispheres and temperate regions. And we know with several other diseases that they have a signature of seasonality. Will this one? We don't know. And right now, the number of people who have immunity to this is so small that whatever impact seasonality has is going to be overwhelmed. Seasonality does not bring a virus to a halt. It slows a virus down. Influenza stops at the end of winter. But if it's a, a strain of influenza that humans have never seen, uh, as happened with H1N1 in 2009, it will transmit in the spring and the summer. It only slows down. And if there's a lot of immunity and there's herd immunity, it slows down enough to break the back of epidemic spread. So what does epidemic spread mean? It means that each infected person infects at least one other person. And Seasonality can slow that down. We think this virus has the potential to go from one infected person to two to three other people. So you have to reduce that enough with herd immunity to break the back. And herd immunity is gonna factor in as well with vaccination, because as you vaccinate more and more people, you will have more people who are immune. This is just showing you different diseases and their seasonality. It, at the top of the screen, it says winter, spring, summer, autumn. And you can see that there's a great deal of variation. There is no pattern here, except for the fact that each of these diseases has a pattern. We've seen a lot of modeling about what this virus is doing and when it's going to peak. And the models keep changing. And they're mathematical. They're based on the best data you have today. And the best data keeps changing. So the models keep changing. I think they're fascinating. This one is from the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation at the University of Washington. It's received a great deal of attention from the White House in particular. People criticize this model. People criticize every model for that matter. Um, I find them fascinating and worth looking at. One other idea that Seth Berkeley, who heads Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, um, is that we need a coordinated, organized way to triage all these vaccines and move them through and to make sure that everyone in the world has access if some of these vaccines do prove effective. How are we going to do that? There are so many vaccines. Are they going to be affordable in the poor countries of the world? Who's going to get them first? Are we going to let rich countries get them first? And so Seth Berkeley, who runs Gavi that vaccinates more children in the world than any program, any single program, is asking the question now, do we need some organization 
to step back as the Manhattan Project in the United States created the atomic bomb, which is a terrible thing. Nobody's arguing that we want to make an, an atomic bomb. But the organization of Manhattan Project said, let's not have scientists each running in his or her own direction. Let's get them on the same program, organize them, streamline it so that we make critical decisions. Hey, these 10 vaccines look better than those 10 vaccines. Let's put our efforts there. Let's speed up manufacturing capabilities here. And it's sorting out wheat from chaff in an organized way. Right now, it's a free for all. And so that's it for my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Thanks, John. Uh, some of the questions that we have coming, just a moment. Some of the questions we have coming um, are also thinking about the connections between, or if you could talk a little bit more about vaccine and testing. So the question of what is delaying widespread testing in the US, but also how that connects then with the impact on developing vaccines. Well, I mean, it has to be done in a staged way because the potential for doing harm is high. Remember, vaccines are going into people who have nothing wrong with them. When you're dying from cancer, you may well want to try a really dangerous drug because your options are few. With a vaccine, the safety bar, it's a safety, it's a risk benefit equation. The safety bar is really high. You don't want to hurt anyone. These are healthy people. We're volunteering. So you have to start with small numbers in order to make sure that nothing weird is going on. And many, many vaccines have been thrown into the garbage can because of what happened in early trials. It's, it's critical that we not cause harm. And is there, in terms of concerns over delayed widespread testing of individuals who actually have the, might have this, any thought yeah, not really. I mean, there, there are so many people. Who, look, far more people don't have this virus than have it right now. We're not mm -hmm. in that, you know, would, would that we had that problem. That would be great. That's not where we're at. It's the, the, the vast majority of the world has no immunity to this virus. There's no shortage of people who you can test vaccines on. And there's no sh uh, lack of enthusiasm for moving as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. This is a question from Lisa, and she asks, with the lack of basic knowledge and interest in science and data among many government officials, how do scientists earn the trust of people and, and in turn the trust uh, of the experts who offer science-based practices? Um, yeah, well, there's a lot of political noise right now. And to get the signal from the noise, listen to the scientists. Try to tune out the politicians as much as possible. By and large, they don't know what they're talking about. By and large, they say things that are misleading or confusing at best. And even when they try to synthesize and communicate what the scientists are saying, give me a scientist who knows how to communicate before a politician who knows how to communicate. Politicians have a, a real serious handicap, and that's that they want good news all the time and they wanna sell positive things all the time. Science is neutral, it's not positive or negative, it's just based on here's what we know. Maybe it's good, maybe it's bad, maybe you wanna hear it, maybe you don't. But that's what we, what we need, we need truth. We don't need to be, we don't need cheerleaders, we don't need to be sold things by salespeople. And you know, I, I, I see the need for politicians, I get it. I'm not arguing, you know, throw out all the politicians. But I am arguing that it's much better to listen to the scientists. The politicians don't have much impact on the way I think. Building on the, the Manhattan Project idea that you, you raised, uh, there's a qu question from Rachel, who is wondering if you think the US, China, Germany, or another country will develop the vac a vaccine first, and then what are the global implications for that fast, equitable distribution. Uh, it's it's a terrifically difficult question. Yeah, go ahead. Anna, sorry. No, that's it. Go ahead. Well, it's, it's a difficult question. So CEPI, the, the group I mentioned that is organized to help speed development of vaccines, they build into contracts equity and access. 
So if you're gonna take their money, you've gotta play by their rules. Uh, but it's a free for all right now. And we've seen bad actions in the past and the United States and, and European countries during the pandemic H1N1 influenza epidemic in 2019, they offered 10% of their vaccine supplies to developing countries and you know, resource limited places. But you know, that's not a solution. That's, that to me is a pretty tacky way to deal with the issues. We need something uh, more rigorous upfront, I think, to make sure that the world at large has access in an equitable way in a reasonable time frame, and that the rich don't um, have this great um, benefit. We're in this together. You know, this world has never had a common enemy like this, ever. I, I, can, I mean, climate change, yes, but there are countries that don't believe in climate change and politicians who don't believe. Show me the politician who doesn't believe that SARS-CoV-2 causes COVID-19, and I'll show you a politician who has no political currency and is heading for the political graveyard. Everyone all over the world knows this is real. Everyone's afraid of this. And we're working together in a way I've never seen before. It's heartening. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm not somebody who gushes with poly, Pollyannish glee about stuff. Uh, I'm pretty reserved about how the world works together. This is not a kumbaya world. We all love each other. You know, I've covered HIV AIDS for, for, for a very long time, for, for more than 30 years now. Trust me, countries don't get along all that well when it comes to solving problems. They all point out their differences, not, not their similarities. And this happens again and again. Um, and they pretend that, oh, well, that, we don't have that in our country. Well, sex workers or gay men or, you know, in the HIV world, the big drivers, people who inject drugs. Oh, we don't have people like that here. Of course, everywhere has these things. But countries fight it and pretend that they're somehow different. That's not happening here. Everyone's on the same page. It's a problem for the world. And we are only going to be safe when we as a world collectively drive this virus away because the big driver is going to be importation for everyone. You can't stop people from moving around. Mm. Can't do it forever. And as people move around, the virus moves around. There's a question that is linking universal health care and the vaccine from Manan. And he wants to know what role does universal health care like in perhaps South Korea play in once the vaccine is developed, administering it. What do you see in terms of that rate of vaccination and thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, universal health care certainly helps with um, all sorts of health issues. Uh, I think COVID-19 has changed the world. I, 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 don't, I don't know how much that's going to come into play here because even in a country like the United States that has a really fractured, balkanized healthcare system, there's such a drive to uh, take care of everyone and to, you know, you, you, I, I'm, I'm gonna use a dirty word. You even see socialist ideas taking root here right now in the United States because people realize we're in this collectively. And, you know, let's make testing free. You know, that's like a mantra coming from the White House. Um, I, I think if there's a vaccine, uh, there will be a big push in the United States to get it to everyone, regardless of healthcare insurance and uh, the universal healthcare issue. So I think it matters, certainly. And there are comorbidities or other diseases people have that are gonna overlap here, that are gonna make people more susceptible. And if you have, Universal healthcare people who have diabetes maybe can keep their diabetes under control and would be less likely to get mm -hmm. severe disease. So I think it matters. But in this question, in this specific narrow question of the vaccine, I'm not sure it's going to make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. we, have, uh, we have now a good couple of dozen uh, questions. So just to our audience, please keep them coming. We may not get to them all, but hopefully we can least get to a goodly number of them now and perhaps after in a in a blog post we can follow up on some one uh turning a bit to something you touched upon john when you began the conversation working from home eves wants to know as a journalist how do you cover covid19 this story lockdown is there a change in how you usually do things well 
Are you seeing other journalists doing things differently, better, worse? So I like to get out into the field. I like to see things. Um, I like to meet with people in hospitals. I like who, who either are caring for people or who are sick. I like to go into labs. I, I, I travel a great deal. I travel probably 25% of the time and Pulitzer Center has helped me travel extensively and I'm incredibly grateful for that. There's nothing like being on the ground and doing field reporting. So that's been a huge handicap. I haven't been able to do field reporting. But the flip side is that when I'm locked into my house like this, I start really early, I go really late. I've been more productive in the past three months in terms of words that have appeared <laughs> online and in print than any three month period of my life, I think. And I, I work the phones and Twitter and email and every app you can imagine to communicate with people internationally. And I collaborate with a team that's international. My, one of my main editors in is Amsterdam, one of the, Martin Enserink and Kai Kupferschmidt is a, a colleague in Berlin who I work with very closely. Martin and Kai and I talk all day long. John Travis, my editor in DC and I, and Tim Appenzeller, the top news editor, we're constantly emailing and communicating. We have meetings upon meetings to figure out who's doing what, where. And then there's a whole team of 20, 30 other news staff I'm working with where we're chatting on Slack all day. Now, you could argue that it's all drowning all of us in communications, but I'm learning how to sift through it quickly and find the nuggets and find what I need. And it's, it's been a tremendous um, output of high quality journalism in my mind. And it's really, we've strived to be really international and we have Dennis Normiel who's in Japan and who lives in Shanghai also. So we have all of this input coming in constantly from you know, really smart people. I mean, the people I work with are, I think the world's best collection of science journalists in one place. And I listen to them and I learn a great deal from them. So we've intensified how much we communicate and that has changed my life. All the communications coming in from other sources are requiring more filtering and it's impossible to keep up with. But by and large, and, and then there's this flood of research papers coming out with mm -hmm. the whole preprint server. You know, it, it used to be that papers appeared in peer-reviewed journals. Well, you know, that was back in the dark ages. I mean, today, everyone's posting everything like in real time, all day, every day, on BioArchive, MedArchive, and every other journal, just rushing stuff out. So I'm reading a tremendous amount. I'm, I'm working some days, literally 18 hours. I mean, I've had several 18-hour days. And uh, I, I get a bit manic about it and it, it, there's an adrenaline thing that pumps in and I've got to watch that and pace myself. Um, and, and my wife, who was a journalist until a couple of years ago, fortunately understands my, my mania <laughs> and puts up with me. But um, uh, it's, it's, been, it's been a fascinating uh, disease to cover and it intersects with so many things that I've covered for my entire career that for me, I know a lot of the people at the front. And so I'm in communication with people who are the biggest thinkers and leaders in the responses because I've known them for years. And, uh, and, I, and I, at the end of the day, I have this great wave of satisfaction because I feel useful. And I think that is why I really work and do my job is to feel useful. That's what I want. Uh, well, we, we appreciate because you're explaining things to us that um, it really helps us better understand what's going on since there's so much out there. And as you're reading these peer reviewed, uh, uh, the, the research, that flood of research papers that you're talking about, we have a couple of questions. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you these in succession and then you can answer them as you see best. So we have from Juliet um, about are there suspicions on why COVID-19 causes some patients to experience neurological issues or even psychological issues? And what are the implications for creating a comprehensive vaccine to address the, these uh, points? The others are from Martin, for example, who asks, uh, he believes he has heard that there might be two strains of COVID-19 and what the impact on vaccine research and development might be related to that. So 
if a vaccine works and it's an ideal vaccine, it's going to prevent infection or clear an infection so quickly that you will have no symptoms from the disease. You will have no impact from that infection. So neurological, psychological problems uh, shouldn't have anything to do with the infection itself, if a vaccine is really effective. Um, the strain question, it always remains a question as to whether any virus will mutate its way around a vaccine. Um, this virus, fortunately, doesn't mutate very quickly. It's not influenza. Influenza has all these mutation tricks that this virus doesn't have. So I have a high level of confidence that we can make a, a vaccine that has durable immunity. The big question really is not about strain differences. It's about how long will our immune system mount an effective response after being exposed naturally or through a vaccine. And will that durability of immunity protect us for life or will it just be a year or two years? And will you need to get booster shots to keep your immunity high? We don't know. Mm -hmm. um, again, it's a problem I hope we have. That's something I look forward to. There's something I didn't mention that I should have mentioned about covering all this, and it's the ridiculous number of press conferences. I mean, it's insane. I have never seen anything like this. And I pay attention to the Coronavirus Task Force every day, World Health Organization. It was the CDC before that was stopped. And then there are, are any number of other press conferences where if you have nothing to do with your time, you can always find somebody holding a virtual press conference these days. And it's, it's occupied a, a great deal of uh, my life covering this. And I guess, is that different than, as you were saying before, was getting out talking to folks, these inordinate number of press conferences? That I, seems to yeah, be a... I, I intensely dislike press conferences in uh, pre-corona. Um, you know, we're in post, there's a before and after moment here. We're, we're in AC after Corona, but BC, um, I, I just have always found press conferences to be something of a waste of time. Um, I much prefer to speak to the people individually. I don't like journalists showboating with their questions. And we have this dr dramatic series going of, you know, basically series television of the Coronavirus Task Force press conferences, where we watch the same group of journalists you know, showboat and ask their questions, and they're always skipping or missing the questions I want to ask. <laughs> so I find all of it uh, riveting and also maddening. Yeah. Well, I think that's also a question that a number of the folks uh, in the audience have asked about in terms of the travel, getting back to that normal schedule, that if there is such thing as normal, do you have thoughts both in terms of looking at um, vaccine development um, when individuals there in California, people have been talking about when things might, the, the criteria for opening up yeah. a little bit off the topic of vaccine. Yeah, no, I mean, your insights. Well, everyone wants to know when can we get back to normal? And I think the answer is it's gonna vary based on where you live. And I don't think we're gonna get back to normal until there's a vaccine. Uh, I think we're going to be in this situation where we have to constantly reassess where we're at and what we need to do. And I think we're going to pulse things like shelter in place for a while. And it will pulse based on our hospital systems and what they can handle. The whole point of this is not to overwhelm hospital systems because we know what happened in Italy and we know what happened in Wuhan and we know what happened in Seattle and in New York when these systems had their, their spines cracked in half. It's horrific. We don't want to go there. So we're going to pulse how we respond based on herd immunity building. Maybe seasonality will slow the virus to some degree. Maybe treatments will help ease the burden on hospitals because if the people don't get into the intensive care units as frequently uh, because there's a drug that has some impact, all of those equations are going to factor in. And we're going to have to keep waking up every day and checking all of our sources and figuring out how we're going to respond that day. It's not going to end for a very long time. And I think my best hope is that the vaccine will come out more quickly than people are predicting. And then we can have some stability. But I don't, I mean, forget it. I'm sorry. 
that life you once knew it just doesn't exist. It's not how we live any longer, and we're not going to for a long time. It's sad. It's tragic. That's our new world. In the in trying to think what we do in our new world, there are there are questions about what folks can do. Uh, you know, in terms of maybe learning more about what herd immunity is, learning more about different areas. So, in particular, we have a, a one person in the audience is wondering what you would recommend in terms of for university students who are in the science related fields what type of uh, what type of lessons they can take from all of this or in terms of also what folks should be learning reading about and, and different places that they can find out more information well I mean every outbreak I've covered has taught me and the world about biology and about the environment um, and I think people are learning tremendous amounts already about phrases that herd immunity has become part of the lexicon, flattening the curve, the whole idea of R naught of a transmission rate. You know, these things have come out of the woodworks and become part of the public lexicon because of COVID-19. And, and I think with Zika, we had discussions about mosquito control that people had not thought through before. With HIV, people learned the immune system in a way that they hadn't before because the virus attacks the immune system. And we've learned about animal vectors and, and zoonotic jumps. Where can you learn more? Well, I think Science Magazine, and I'm going to sell us for a moment, has a phenomenal resource that's free where you can read our coverage, which goes in depth on anything that interests you. Just look at the headlines and the photographs, and I guarantee you there is no single better place I know of, and we also do hypertext links to things, than that resource. So I would start there, um, and you can broaden it out to uh, in the depth of your interest. You know, you can, you can dive very deep into any specific thing you want um, with a Google search. It's not hard to do. You know, if you do a Google search about vaccines and the spike protein, if you have that specific question, you'll get a lot of resources right away. Now, some of them will be horrible and junk, and some of them will be mediocre, and some of them will be okay, some of them will be good, and some will be great. But that's our job as journalists, is to sift through information and find the great stuff. That's what we do. I mean, I've said this a bunch of times when people talk about, oh, this flood of information in this era. Well, I'm 61. I used to use this thing called a library. And when you walk in a library, if it's a good library, there are thousands of books and smart people find the good books. That's what it meant to be smart when I was young. You knew where the good books were. You found the good books. You read one good book that led you to another good book. That's what intelligence is. And we have to use our intellectual faculties to find the best information and as journalists, that's the service we provide. We're doing the filtering because we're trained to filter and to find the best information. Thank you, John. That was a, a great wrap up, shall we say, because we are hitting uh, time now. And I know we haven't gotten to everyone's questions and we'll aim to answer some of those in our follow up when we share the, the recording with you. But I just wanna thank John and thanks to our audience today for your interest and, and questions and our colleagues at the Pulitzer Center, uh, especially Holly Pippenberg, as I mentioned, our producer for this series. What we wanna do now, say our thanks to John, and then to also let you know if you could stay together with us or for a few minutes longer. Remember, we have a brief survey coming up uh, that will pop up once we uh, officially end today's session in just a few moments. We also want to let you know of some upcoming events uh, on April 21st, Indigenous Lands and the Land Grant University si System, featuring Pulitzer Center grantees Tristan Eitan and Robert Lee. And on April 23rd, just a week from today, again, another in our Science and Health series, The Next Great Migration, featuring Pulitzer Center grantee Sonia Shaw. And Sonia is another of the journalists we've supported through the year. She will discuss her reporting on infectious disease outbreaks, climate change, and disrupted migration patterns that are uh, led to this for forthcoming book, The Next Great Migration. So please join us next week and feel uh, free to share widely. Remember, we are a nonprofit journalism organization. We support journalists like John and his colleagues at Science, and as such, we depend on support from donors like you. 
So for more reporting on our upcoming events and how you can support the Pulitzer Center, please visit us at pulitzercenter.org. I'm gonna sign off and thank you for your support and for being with us today. Have a good afternoon. Thanks everyone.